If there's one consistent thing about the otherwise ever-changing understanding of dinosaurs, from the antediluvian monsters of centuries past to the gigantic stem birds of the modern decades, it's the tendency to think of these bygone beasts as wonderfully weird, totally unlike anything alive today. Some truly bizarre speculations have come and gone, from scavenging giant ground vulture tyrannosauruses to metamorphic toroceratopses. But when it comes to speculative behaviors, arguably the murkiest and most mysterious of all aspects of study, they can often wind up painting the entire image of a species in the zeitgeist for decades to come. One such idea was that one of the most well-known classic dinosaurs had some truly bizarre techniques for dealing out its bloody business, swinging its head about less like a biting beast and more like a lumberjack's hatchet. Allosaurus is often thought of as the default theropod. The basic body plan the group was often generalized as for over 100 years. Around 50 specimens have been found since the genus' description in 1877 by Othniel Charles Marsh as part of the infamous Bone Wars. Several species across North America and Europe have been identified, and until the description of Tyrannosaurus some decades after the Bone Wars, Allosaurus held the lofty status as the cream of the crop. I am the cream. I am the cream, yeah. The cream of the crop! Of dinosaur apex predators. Thanks to fairly complete finds and quality museum mounts, Allosaurus has continued to be a mainstay in the popular understanding of dinosaurs, even with the tyrant king usurping its title. With plenty of specimens came plenty of research and it was only a matter of time until the dinosaur renaissance would give one of the best represented theropods some focus. In 1998, frontrunner of the renaissance, Dr. Robert Bakker, noted that Allosaurus had some similar adaptations to saber-toothed cats, like Smilodon. While the different lizard lacked the namesake fangs of the saber-tooth, Bakker shed light on how the carnosaur seemed to have some similarities. Namely, a jaw less specialized in clamping or crunching down, the possibility for a wide gape and particularly powerful neck muscles to drive the jaws into a target. Bakker speculated that Allosaurus' numerous serrated teeth could have hacksawed through prey in a similar manner to the serrations along the blades of the Smilodon, ignoring the fact that Smilodon fangs were made for puncturing and holding on to prey, of course. Other researchers keyed in on this with far less speculative analyses. A 2001 study by Emily Rayfield and a group of her colleagues used something called a finite element analysis to study the mechanics of Allosaurus jaws. Finite element analysis is a popular method of estimating structural strength with application in man-made and natural structures. Using the methods and models available to them, the team found Allosaurus skulls could withstand over 55,000 newtons of vertical force across the upper tooth rows. However, the models estimated the jaws could only bite down with about 800 newtons of force. This didn't seem to make much sense for a predator dispatching prey with a conventional bite, like a big cat or crocodile. For comparisons, 800 newtons is roughly equivalent to some panthers, and is less than some hefty chompers of today, like spotted hyenas and large bears. Why would an allosaurus head withstand forces almost 70 times what the jaws could crunch down with, if it could only bite down roughly as hard as a jaguar less than a tenth its mass? Bite force never approaches the limits of how much force a skull can take, but a divide this big seemed strange. These researchers, and others following their work, speculated this meant that Allosaurus, and possibly some other carnosaurs like it, truly had weak jaws and might have attacked prey differently than any modern predator. Opening its mouth as wide as possible, the thought went that Allosaurus repeatedly swung its head up and down like a hatchet. This could cause a lot of bloody shredding wounds and cause big game like sauropods or stegosaurs to bleed out rapidly, 
whilst still having a quick nimble neck and jaw to catch smaller game. Follow-up work by Rayfield and company, as well as other researchers like Thomas Holtz, proposed that some carnosaurs like Allosaurus could have used this or similar strategies to flesh graze. By ambushing large but slower moving sauropods, the thought was that a big carnosaur like Allosaurus could lunge forward and take a mouthful of flesh before breaking off and retreating. This would let the prey survive and regrow the tissue and the process would repeat. This sort of attack method blurs the line between predation and parasitism and is seen today in the tiny cookie cutter sharks who take chunks out of seals and whales. The idea of this enigmatic lion of the Jurassic using such a peculiar hunting method was too enticing not to talk about. Documentaries from BBC's 2011 work Planet Dinosaur to the less well-received Dinosaur with Stephen Fry in 2023 featured Allosaurus prominently, and both of these examples brought up the same observations for largely the same conclusion. Wide gape plus weak bite force plus sharp teeth plus sturdy head equals hatchet bite. If an aim of the dinosaur renaissance was to make dinosaurs weirder than the sluggish backward brutes of time bygone, it succeeded with Allosaurus using its snout like a tomahawk. Except this might be a case where the speculations outpaced the science. Hey, while I have your attention, I have two other channels you should check out when you get a chance. Edge of Reality is where I talk about cryptids and the paranormal. Anything that is creepy, crawly, and outside of the realm of science. Edge's World of Monsters is where I tackle basically anything fictitious, whether that be kaiju or dragons. All hypotheses are put through peer review and subject to revision or support in years after. The idea of Allosaurus as a weak-jawed, hatchet head is one such case where newer findings have largely debunked this idea, despite how popular it is as a talking point. How this idea came about and became so widely circulated is a bit of a Venn diagram of various factors. From how zoology research influences paleontology, the technology available at the time, and how paleontology exists in the popular consciousness. Paleontology is, after all, something of a crossover between geology and biology, with lots of outreach into pop culture thanks to how well known some things like dinosaurs are. Add in how well represented and known Allosaurus is, and the overlapping factors start to become a lot clearer. To start us off, the dinosaur renaissance was a turning point in paleontology. A lot of great work and new thought went into these prehistoric creatures which yesteryear largely just wrote off as sluggish, brutish evolutionary failures. However, at times, speculations about behavior seemed to outpace what could be known about the skeleton. A lot of speculative behaviors, just hypothesized, perhaps off the cuff, could wind up getting talked about without a lot of physical research work going into it. Let's also remember, understanding of modern animals that might serve as points of comparison was going through a renaissance of its own that would also take decades to progress. At the same time work was underway on the hatchet by hypothesis, a lot of sources were still unironically using the term alpha wolf and thought that Komodo dragons hunted by biting and releasing to kill prey with bacterial sepsis. Nowadays it's known that wolves are just family units led by parents and Komodo dragons are active predators that will kill on the spot but do have venom in their mouths as well. But hindsight is 2025 and those two myths and more were widely parroted for years. Same thing happened with Allosaurus' noggin use. And with some types of dinosaurs, like the massive multi-ton theropods, seemingly so different than anything alive today, there might not have been as much of a push to look for a modern analog with these supposed hatchet heads as there otherwise would have been. After all, if we are assuming dinosaurs are bizarre beasts unlike anything alive today, it makes sense they would be doing things unlike anything alive today as well. It's not exactly like the largest modern theropods such as ostriches are apex predators to use as a comparison. 
Another influence on the hatchet bite hypothesis was the advancement in computer modeling software between the 1990s and early 2000s. The finite element analysis done by the 2001 study that originally gave a fully grown allosaurus a biting force of only 800 newtons was later updated. Different techniques and more precise 3D models made with more modern laser scans of the original fossils have helped out a lot with this. In 2012, researchers K.T. Bates and P.L. Falkingham developed modern dynamic musculoskeletal models compared to what they had to work with in the early 2000s. Models were made of Tyrannosaurus, Allosaurus, and the American Alligator to study the jaw mechanics of each. They found that while Allosaurus was not in the same league as a Tyrannosaurus over half a dozen times its mass, it still had a very respectable biting pressure of over 8,000 newtons. This is far above modern crocodilians and is much closer to what one should expect for a predator of its size. Allosaurus may not have been able to crunch down nearly as hard as giants like a Tyrannosaurus or a Tyrannosaur of equal size, but it's not to say that its jaw was at all weak. Forces like what the more recent studies indicate would still be more than enough to leave marks on bone, which does explain the numerous bite marks suspected to be from Allosaurus left on the bones of other dinosaurs. In a roundabout way, part of the inspiration for the hatchet bite hypothesis did wind up being true. Studies by Stephen Lautenschahir and friends from 2015 verified that Allosaurus did indeed have a very wide gape, able to open its mouth potentially between 79 and 92 degrees. This is wide, however, not wide enough to use its head like a tomahawk. The lower jaw would just get in the way and there would be far too much strain on the uppermost teeth on the upper jaw. If Allosaurus really was attacking game like this, then more pronounced fangs across the front half of the top jaw and more signs of tooth wear atypical of bites on the teeth and injuries or feeding bites left on prey would be expected. This might seem odd, as a 2013 study by Eric Snively and colleagues did determine that Allosaurus had a very flexible but powerful neck and was likely feeding on prey by biting and pulling back strips and chunks of meat. In this respect, it would have resembled predatory dinosaurs of today, like eagles and hawks, implying Allosaurus pinned food down underfoot before ripping out pieces with its numerous sharp teeth acting like the slicing beak of modern raptors. But what about hunting? If the wide gape and strong neck were not employing the hatchet bite, then what? Turns out, there actually is a modern predator with its own slew of misunderstandings that does have a few points of comparison. Now, uh, no comparison is going to be one-to-one, -one, but comparing Allosaurus to big cats that often kill with bite and clamp throat bites or crocodilians that crunch down and hold prey and do a death roll might not have been the best comparison to Allosaurus after all. Komodo dragons are one of the few macro predators alive today with xiphodont teeth. These big lizard teeth, laterally compressed, slightly recurved, and serrated on one or both sides have more than a few similarities to those of Allosaurus. These large monitor lizards actually have far less clamping force than one might expect, less than most canines far lighter than it. Their bite only needs to be strong enough to jam their very sharp teeth deep into the flesh of a target. From there, the lizard thrashes and shakes with its powerful neck and body. The lacerations caused by this attack can be gruesome and lethal all on their own. Despite their reputation as being the largest modern venomous reptiles, Komodos rarely outright kill with their anticoagulant venom. If they can dispatch their prey then and there, they do it. A predator with a wide gape, sharp, serrated teeth that can shred into flesh and a powerful neck and body to use muscle force to drive the teeth into a target and then leverage its bite force to hang on and take its literal pound of flesh with it sounds familiar to something from the Jurassic. 
If Allosaurus hunted like this, its hacksaw-like tooth row and powerful neck would have given it all the assets it needed, no hatchet swinging required. The skull being especially sturdy when holding up to vertical thrashing and pulling movements, as indicated by the 2001 study, actually makes sense for both attacking and feeding in this way. It also makes the speculation by Bakker hold up very well in hindsight because research on saber-toothed cats also has indicated some of them employed their neck muscles just as much, if not more, in driving their killing bites into prey as their jaws did. Non-avian dinosaurs might not be exactly like many animals of today, but they aren't so weird as to be without comparison. The reason some older ideas like the hatchet swinging headgear on Allosaurus can still wind up lingering in the popular consciousness is part of the nature of paleontology. Prehistoric animals like non-avian dinosaurs are extremely popular, and like popular characters in fiction or enigmatic animals in the modern day, it's easy to assign tropes and features to them to make each distinct. This is why some ideas that might have had contradictory evidence to them years ago, like pack hunting super predatory raptors, two brained stegosaurs, and scavenging tyrannosaurs, still tends to crop up in popular media that can circulate around in the pop culture zeitgeist. This is especially true if it makes the dinosaurs weirder or seems contradictory to what was previously thought. And that is such an enticing topic to follow. And you can certainly bet clickbaiting headlines almost always like a strange story. Often, it takes another landmark piece of paleo media to counteract some of these tropes. Every new piece of research is important, but it's also important to remember research is always ongoing. That's why the educational outreach side of paleontology is important to try and keep the public up to date and consult new projects with the latest information. That way, hopefully your understanding of these magnificent animals can evolve and change over the years just like they did over millions of them. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.